It's, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce, uh, well, it's kind of the useless job of introducing the man who needs no introduction around here, Professor Nick Graham. Uh, of course, Nick was a fixture in these hallways for many years. Um, Nick has endless accolades. He's a Royal Society Fellow, a frequent flyer on the highly cited list. He's received the Mid-Career Award from the Coral Reef Society, held a DECRA from the ARC, and a fellowship from the Queensland Government. Uh, it's hard to overstate Nick's contribution, not only to coral reef ecology, but also to, I think, of, of course, the much more interesting linkage between ecology and, and social science. And it's, you know, it's safe to say that that uh, interdisciplinarity is, is very close to Nick's heart. He married a social scientist. Now, beyond the academy, Nick also stands out for being an incredibly warm and generous and funny person. And I, I consider him one of my dearest friends in the world, and indeed he's the, the, grand, the godfather to my, uh, my son, Isaiah. So uh, Nick, we're really happy that you could join us. Um, a little disappointed it's not in person, so we're looking forward to the, the next time we can uh, uh, drink a beer together. So Nick, take it away. Thanks very much, Josh. It's <clears throat> I highly recommend having Josh um, introduce you to it for a talk. He, does a, he, he lavishes praise very well. Okay, so you'll have to mute your, your speaker now though, Josh, because I know you, you can be quite loud. <laughs> I've never heard that before. <laughs> thanks, mate. Uh, and thanks for the invite to, to give this, this uh, seminar today. Um, so I'm going to be, um, mo uh, I guess, moving on from the seminar I gave at the center two to three years ago. And, and I know some of you wouldn't have been at that, but, but uh, some of you might have been. Um, so the last talk I gave in the centre was around the seabird nutrient subsidy work that uh, I've, I've been doing in the Chagos Archipelago. So we've moved on from that work now and I want to start by acknowledging Dr Casey Benquit who's been working with me on this project now uh, for about, uh, well coming on for three years. So. I'm going to start by giving a, a brief summary of, the, of the, the initial paper we put out that I presented last time, and then I'm going to move on and present four new studies that we've done, um, uh, uh, all of which have been led by Casey. Okay, so I'm taking you mostly to the Chagos Archipelago today in the Central Indian Ocean. Um, it's quite a unique place, it's, it's, uh, it's remote, um, it's, uh, it's a marine reserve, it's, it's largely uh, unfished, and it also has 10 IBAs, that's internationally important bird areas. So some islands look like this. They've got uh, abundant seabirds on them, a high diversity of seabirds. They're noisy, they're smelly, they're, 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 they're really vibrant uh, terrestrial ecosystems. But near, nearby, on adjacent islands, the scene is very different. The islands themselves are similar in terms of uh, size and, and geomorphology, but they have introduced black rats present that have been there probably since the early 1700s. And so there's next to no seabirds. The skies are empty, it's quiet, and, and it's a lot less smelly. So these seabirds are mostly feeding out in the open ocean. Some of them are, uh, are, are going out for two to three days at a time, hundreds of kilometers offshore, and they're feeding on small pelagic fish. They then return to the islands where they're, they're, they're breeding, they're roosting, and they're depositing huge amounts of nutrients through guano, through feathers, through dead birds, uh, onto the islands. So they're fertilizing those islands. And as I said, it's really chalk and cheese whether the rats are present, just how, how, how much, uh, uh, how many seabirds and how much uh, guano and, and nutrients are being delivered. So I'm going to very briefly um, uh, refresh your memory, uh, or, or for those that haven't, uh, uh, haven't seen this, give me, uh, haven't seen me give a talk about this before or seen the paper, just very, give a very quick overview of that first paper we published. So we visited uh, six islands with, uh, with no rats present. So they'd never have had rats in their history. That's the islands on the, on the left on this heat map. And six islands that did have rats. 
And here we've got a heat map of the biomass of six different families of seabirds. And the take home is, as the, as the photos very clearly showed, that there's far more birds on the islands where there's no rats. They, 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 the, the birds just simply avoid the islands with rats. They, 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 you know, they, they've come to learn that, that uh, their, their eggs will be predated upon and, and they don't go near those islands. So there's 750 times more seabirds uh, on the islands with no rats. And that equates to around 250 times more nitrogen input onto those islands. So next we used stable isotopes of nitrogen, so delta 15N, to get a measure of, 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 of uh, and we used percent 10 as well, to get a measure of the amount of nitrogen and, and, and the source, as in the trophic level of that nitrogen, uh, on, from various different tissues. So on the islands, we collected soil and new growth leaves. On the reef flat, we collected filter feeding sponges and halomeda macroalgae. And on the reef crest, we collected turf algae and um, herbivorous damselfish. The reef crests are about 250 meters offshore in this case. So here, the, the, the first little panel there is the delta 15N for soil on the islands. And, and you can see that there's a, there's a huge difference, a huge effect size uh, between the soil that's, that's found uh, on the islands with rats versus the islands with, with seabirds. And if we bring the rest of the data in, that, that effect size attenuates, it gets smaller as you go out onto the reef crest, but it's still present even in the, in the muscle tissue of, of the damselfish. So those nutrients are, 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 are reaching right out to the reef crest, they're leaching off the islands uh, and they're getting taken up into the food web. We looked at the growth of these damselfish using otoliths um, and we found that the fish were growing faster uh, next to islands with seabirds and they were larger for a given, uh, for a given age. So these nutrient inputs, these nutrient subsidies are affecting the demographic rate of this damselfish. And that translated in, uh, across the food web. So here is, is the biomass estimates for different feeding groups of fish. Um, above that blue line, uh, there's, there's more biomass adjacent to islands with, with seabirds. And you can see that across the board, uh, biomass levels for different feeding groups of fish uh, are elevated next to the islands with seabirds. It's nearly, the, the biomass, in fact, was nearly 50% greater. So there's a real sort of fertilization effect propagating through the food web, we think. Okay, I've, I've raced through that fairly quickly because some of you will have uh, heard that before, uh, but I wanted to, 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 to go over it just to, to give a bit of context before I move on to the, uh, the, the, this, the work we've been doing since this first study. So because we found that the, um, the biomass uh, was, uh, was higher for, for um, all um, feeding groups of fish that we looked at there, uh, but we'd only really looked at the demographic rates or the growth rates in particular of, of the damselfish. We wanted to see, we wanted to look at a larger fish, we wanted to look at a functionally important fish. So uh, in this study, we assessed the, demogra the demographic trade-offs associated with these nutrient subsidies in, in a parrotfish. So we worked on the bullet head parrotfish, Chlororus sordidus, and this was in collaboration with Brett Taylor and Mark Meekin from Ames. And uh, we collected uh, these guys from around, uh, from reefs around um, islands with rats and islands uh, with uh, seabirds or no rats. And this first figure uh, is just showing that the uh, percent nitrogen in the muscle tissue of, of these parrotfish is greater. Uh, adjacent to the islands with seabirds. So, so that's confirming that the, uh, the nutrient subsidy from those seabirds that's leaching into the, uh, into the coral reef environment is getting taken up by these fish and uh, assimilating into their tissues. So then we looked at the, the growth rate of these parrotfish. Uh, so this is a growth curve for the uh, individuals on reefs around islands with seabirds. 
and this is the growth curve for the uh, individuals around Ireland with, with rats presence and no seabird nutrient subsidy. And very similar uh, to the pattern for the uh, damselfish, growth rates were faster um, uh, around the islands with seabirds. Uh, the fish tend to be larger for a given age. So a really similar pattern. In fact, um, the parrotfish are growing uh, about 22% faster around the islands with seabirds. So, so, so it, it's not an insignificant difference. And what was really interesting we thought was that the, the, um, the influence of these seabird subsidies on growth rates was very similar for, the, for these two, two groups of, uh, of fish. Um, so the parrotfish, um, you know, mostly gaining its energy through microbial communities and the damselfish mostly through, through um, uh, herbivory and um, they're both growing around 22 to 25% faster. So this this influence of the seabird nutrient subsidy on, on the growth rate uh, and, and, and how that's uh, enhancing the biomass of the greater fish community uh, at, at least extends into the parrotfish. Um, and and we're, we're doing some more work now to see, to see how it influences other, other parts of the food web. Now, what we we're interested in was if, if we also saw increases in, in other demographic traits. So we wanted to look at, uh, at reproduction. Uh, we tried to do this in various ways. So, so, so we collected the, um, the gonads from, uh, from these parrotfish and we, our hope was to look at egg density and egg size and so on, but the histology just, just wasn't, uh, wasn't up to it, unfortunately, after a huge amount of effort in the field. So what we could do was look at GSI, that's the gonad to somatic index, um, and what it showed was that there's an indication that there's lower reproductive investment um, uh, adjacent to the islands for seabirds. So this is suggesting a, a for a given length, that is, of course. So that's suggesting that these fish are trading off, they're, they're, they're investing in growth rather than reproduction um, uh, uh, when they have these nutrient subsidies. Now, of course, even though by length you have, you have a difference in, uh, in, in GSI there, um, actual gonad weight scales uh, positively with, um, uh, with body size. And we know from, from the whole body of research that the you know, bigger individuals uh, produce uh, more eggs. So the next thing we looked at was the uh, body size distribution uh, on these islands and as you would expect because the fish are growing faster there's uh, larger bodied fish adjacent to the island with with seabirds compared to the islands with rats so so they, they, they tend to be a larger larger sized community and if you translate that to a uh, gonad weight uh, then it's likely that there's actually a similar popular population level reproductive potential uh, around islands that are rat free versus rat infested. So there's a, uh, the, 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 uh, to summarize this study, there seems to be a demographic trade-off where, where fish are, are, are putting energy, the excess energy from the nutrients, I guess, into, into growth at the expense of reproduction per, uh, by body size. But um, um, overall, because of that faster growth, reproductive potential is likely similar. Okay, so the initial work that Sean Wilson and I did for, for, for the, uh, the paper we published in Nature, uh, uh, those data were collected in 2015. And we all know that 2016 was a devastating year uh, in terms of coral bleaching. Um, this map here in Terry's um, 2018 paper in Science um, highlights the, uh, the locations where severe bleaching occurred. Uh, and Chagos is very much among them. Uh, on average, about 60% um, coral cover was lost uh, across the Chagos archipelago in 2016. So Casey and I returned to um, uh, repeat the exact same underwater surveys uh, around, around the same islands in, in May 2018. 
So this was before and after that, that, that 2016 coral bleaching event. With the intention of, of, of investigating how the community structure of, of the benthos and the fish had changed through the bleaching event and, and if there was an influence of the seabird nutrients on how the reefs responded. There is some um, theory or expectation that um, when uh, corals receive a, a balanced input of nitrogen and phosphorus, um, that they can actually have higher thermal resistance and, and, uh, and, and so to, um, uh, maintain fitness in, in the face of warmer temperatures. Uh, th that's in contrast to, uh, to human nutrient input that tends to be uh, very nitrogen heavy and phosphorus limited, which does the opposite, so the thermal threshold comes down. So we were interested to see if there was an influence of, of these seabird nutrient subsidies on the, on, the, on the coral cover, but also the community structure in general. We're going to start with some multivariate plots and, and here we've got in blue um, the uh, community composition of the benthos around islands with seabirds and in red islands, islands um, with rats. This is the pre-bleaching data. So if we look uh, post-bleaching now, there was a, a smaller shift in the composition of the benthos um, for the islands with, uh, with, with rats present, but there was this huge, huge change in the community composition around islands with seabirds, uh, particularly shifting towards uh, CCA and Halamida, which I'll come back to, uh, I'll come back to shortly. If we look at the fish now, uh, similar, similar idea of how to look at the data. So these are the pre-bleaching data. Uh, post, post bleaching, uh, there was a shift in, in um, a substantial shift in both um, islands with seabirds and islands with rats. Uh, a, 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 particularly large shift for the islands with, with, with rats. So these, um, um, the, these the, the community composition of these fish communities has changed dramatically and it looks quite different uh, um, uh, depending on whether the reefs were next to islands with seabirds or not. Okay, so looking at those data, breaking it down into a bit more detail um, here, Again, we've got red is islands with uh, rats and blue is islands with, with seabirds. So for coral cover, and remember I, we were wondering whether we would see uh, any difference here, uh, that it, it wasn't detectable at all. So I think the, the stress event, the thermal uh, stress event was just too severe um, and, and coral was lost regardless of whether the reefs were adjacent to, uh, uh, to these nutrient subsidies or not. Uh, there was an atoll effect. In fact, the smaller of the atolls that we work at um, uh, tended to have the least impact and the larger atolls have, have the most loss of coral. Um, we haven't got data to really pin down why, why that is. We suspect it's because the smaller, more enclosed atoll has uh, experiences greater fluctuations in, in temperature, greater variability in temperature under normal conditions. So it was able to, to cope with the heat stress event. What became really interesting is when we looked at pavement uh, calcifying algae, um, so CCA and Halamida. So while on the Ratti Islands, pavement really dominated post, uh, post bleaching, on, on the uh, islands with seabirds, um, the reefs became dominated by um, CCA and Halamida. So these calcifying algae completely took off and started dominating space and we saw huge increases in, in their coverage. So while there was no difference in the loss of, of coral cover, and, um, there, there was um, uh, th this big enhancement in calcifying algae within two years of bleaching. And this obviously is too early to say much about recovery of coral, but it's, it's quite encouraging that uh, calcifying algae have, has taken off CCA, we all know, is important. It can consolidate the substrate um, uh, and, and can, uh, uh, um, can be useful for corals to settle into. Palamida, uh, uh, you know, we're a lot less certain about what that's going to mean for these reefs, um, whether it's going to be a problem for recovery. 
Um, it, they, they do turn over quite quickly, Halimeda, and they're actually quite important for sediment supply. Uh, so that in itself is interesting for these low-lying uh, tropical islands. Um, and bearing in mind that these reefs also got severely impacted in the 1998 bleaching event, um, we, we don't think these Halimeda are, are going to remain dominant on the reefs as they didn't after 98. But, but we are monitoring these reefs to see what happens uh, and I'll come back to that shortly. So in terms of the fish here, uh, we've broken them down into six feeding groups again. Um, for the top three panels there, so we've got herbivores, piscivores and mixed diet feeders, the biomass, the enhanced biomass around islands with seabirds was maintained. So they've still got a, a greater biomass of uh, of herbivores, piscivores, and mixed diet feeders, or mixed diet carnivores in particular, those are. Uh, along the bottom, however, all three groups here, uh, these tend to be slightly smaller fish and often more specialized. Um, we saw quite a substantial drop in the biomass of these groups and uh, uh, homogenization um, between the islands with, with seabirds and the islands with rats. So for the fish, we, we're seeing greater biomass of some key groups of fish is being maintained through, through these bleaching events. And again, that's hopefully uh, fairly promising news. So there's higher herbivore biomass in particular, but also higher, um, higher biomass of predators in the system. So, so some of the functions of these fish are, are, are provided to the reef are being maintained at a higher rate around the islands with seabirds, despite this major bleaching event. So what we're really interested in now over the longer term from that 2016 bleaching event is whether um, coral recovery happens at a different rate between islands that have nutrient subsidies and islands that don't. And as I said, there's, there's an expectation from, um, from lab-based work that corals will grow faster uh, with, with elevated nutrients when it's balanced uh, between nitrogen and phosphorus as seabird guano is. Uh, from our own work, we've, we've shown that the, uh, the nitrogen in, in corals is greater uh, in, in, in coral tissue adjacent to the islands with seabirds. There's a nice study from Candida Savage uh, from New Zealand. She worked in, uh, in Fiji and did a reciprocal transplant experiment of, of Acropora between an island uh, that has rats present and an island with lots of seabirds in Fiji. And she found that these uh, transplanted corals uh, grow four times faster adjacent to, the, adjacent to where the islands with the seabirds when they've been transplanted there. So, so there's evidence, uh, of mounting evidence, that these seabird nutrients or these balanced nutrient inputs can have a, an important impact on, on uh, coral growth. Now we've got a beautiful experiment set up in the Chagos Archipelago uh, where we've looked at six islands again with and, with and without uh, rats and seabird subsidies and we've got uh, reciprocal transplants, we've got tad colonies, we've got monitoring to, to, try, and, to try and look at uh, differences in growth rates and recovery potential uh, recruitment surveys and so on. And we went back earlier this year to try and get the final uh, data on, on, um, uh, on this experiment and of course COVID hit and scuppered all our plans as it did many others. And uh, after about two days of field work, uh, there was about 14 days of desperately trying to get out of a remote location before all of the flights fully shut down, uh, which we managed by the skin of our teeth. Um, here's a coral that we, uh, that we transplanted onto an island with, uh, with seabirds um, and, and one that we did manage to revisit this year. Uh, just to show the, uh, you know, the, the growth here. But I guess watch this space. We're, we're trying to get back out to Chagos um, as soon as we're able to, um, to finish off this, uh, th this work and, and be able to say something about coral growth and, and uh, recovery rate uh, uh, in, in, in the presence of seabird subsidies. Okay, so the next um, uh, paper I want to talk about um, is looking at biodiversity ecosystem function relationships. Um, 
in particular looking at these relationships under multiple stresses. So we looked at two measures of function. Um, um, uh, function in these kinds of experiments is often looked at in terms of, of biomass. So we looked at, uh, we looked at, looked at this in terms of um, a standing stock of biomass, um, but also uh, a more dynamic view, so using productivity measures um, uh, based off the, um, the work developed by Anato Marais. Uh, and we looked at two stresses, um, coral bleaching and um, introduced rats, so introduced species, in terms of, uh, of, of um, the nutrient subsidy again. So the, the idea here is that um, uh, with more biodiversity, um, uh, theory suggests that you get more existing function, so more species, more function uh, in, in a linear fashion. Um, but <clears throat> stresses may, may interact with this relationship in, in different ways. There may be a, a direct impact on biodiversity, so reduction of biodiversity. So even if you keep the, the, the same slope of the biodiversity existing function relationship, you can reduce biodiversity, which, which then reduces function. You may have, uh, uh, the stressor may influence the shape of the relationship or the, or, or, or the shape of the slope uh, of biodiversity and system function, positively or negatively, or it may reduce function directly uh, across the board. So the slope may stay the same, but you, but, but you have a reduction in function through a, a direct pathway. So this is what we wanted to look at. And there's been lots of experimental work done on this question, but very little uh, sort of large-scale field-based studies looking at how multiple stresses can influence the relationship between biodiversity and existing function. So again, it's the same study system out, out in the Chagos archipelago, looking at um, seabirds and, uh, and rats and, and pre- and post-bleaching. Um, we thought to look at this question in, in, in the Chagos archipelago because um, it's quite easy for other anthropogenic stresses, particularly fishing in the marine environment, to, to, to make it challenging to understand biodiversity existing function relationships. Because fishing um, directly influences biomass and, and it selectively uh, removes larger bodied fish. Um, so it disproportionately affects biomass. Um, it's, it's very hard to tease apart um, um, whether fishing or whether biodiversity is, is driving patterns. Here we're looking at a system which is unfished, um, so, so we've removed that confounding factor of fishing, so we felt we could, uh, we could tackle the problem quite nicely here. So here's the relationship, I'm just going to show you the one for biomass because productivity shows very similar patterns, but here's the relationship between biodiversity and existing function um, um, for reefs that are um, pre and post bleaching, so that solid line and dash line, and uh, with seabirds or with rats, so that's blue versus orange. And you can see that the positive relationship and, 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 and the slopes are very similar despite uh, the multiple stresses. So regardless of the multiple stresses, we get these nice, um, strong biodiversity existing function relationships. But you will notice that the, uh, the, the position of the lines and the spread of the data is quite different. And that comes to those different pathways that the disturbances may still impact, uh, impact this relationship and impact function. So to unpack this in a bit more detail, we used uh, path analysis or structural equation modeling. And I'm gonna start by showing the, the, the direct pathways towards uh, uh, biomass, and we found that the strongest positive effect on existing function in this case was biodiversity, and the strongest negative effect was the introduced rats removing the uh, nutrient subsidy. If we bring in the indirect pathways, uh, we find the strongest positive effect is structural complexity influencing, uh, positively influencing richness or biodiversity. And um, the strongest negative is the, uh, 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 the climate extreme, again, has that direct 
uh, negative effect on, on, on biodiversity, on richness. So to summarize, the climate extreme uh, reduced ecosystem function via a diversity mediated pathway, so through richness, whereas the loss of nutrients because of the invasive species decreased ecosystem function via a direct pathway, and, that, and, and that's really by the loss of that nutrient subsidy, uh, reducing growth rates and reducing biomass directly. So back to this schematic, the biodiversity ecosystem function slopes, the relationships are still there with these, with these stresses, but the climate extreme is, is, is having a negative impact through reducing fish diversity, which in turn reduces function. Uh, so that's reducing the slopes this way. Um, and the invasive rats have a direct influence on, on the existing function across the board. So conserving biodiversity uh, clearly is important for maintaining functions, um, but, um, um, but these, different, um, uh, these different stresses on, on reefs can influence uh, the uh, existing function in, in, in uh, three different pathways. Okay, so next and, and finally, I'm now going to move on to talking a little bit about rat eradication. So the obvious conservation um, outcome or, or, or suggestion from this body of work is that um, removing rats from islands uh, could have a benefit um, uh, in terms of, of, of reinstating nutrient subsidies. And I think what's um, interesting about that, or, or particularly useful about that, is that um, it, it should, removing rats should have um, a benefit both terrestrially and in the marine environment. So on islands themselves, removing rats, which may need some habitat restoration as well in terms of vegetation cover that's present, but removing rats should see a return of seabird populations onto the islands. And there's a whole body of, of research by David Wardle and, and uh, Gary Pollis and um, uh, Jim Estes and Don Kroll and others uh, that's shown that where seabirds are present on, on islands, there's a huge influence on, on, on biodiversity, on uh, biomass of vegetation, on demographic rates and abundance of invertebrates and so on. So there'll be, there should be uh, a, a big benefit of of, of removing rats on the terrestrial environment. And potentially, if the seabirds return, there should be this uh, return of nutrient subsidy, which influences, uh, as, as we've been showing, the uh, productivity and functioning of, of near shore coral reefs. Um, so rat eradication has become a big priority. There are, there are NGOs that are uh, dedicated to pretty much solely doing that. There's, there's one called um, uh, Island Conservation based out of California. And I think there's something like about 600 islands have had rats eradicated now across the world. So, so it, it is a big priority. Uh, Lord Howe Island is, is the latest there where there's been a, a big rat eradication effort. So we expanded our work um, outside the Czechos archipelago uh, here um, to also include the scattered islands, which uh, is a group of um, uh, French islands uh, that sort of circumnavigate uh, Madagascar. So we've included um, uh, scattered islands. We've also included some additional islands and sites in the Chagos archipelago where, where, where some rat eradication has now happened as well uh, to try and uh, get this third treatment. So we have rats absent, and in this case, that means uh, they've never been present. Uh, rats, rats present, um, so, so there's introduced rats on those islands, uh, and then the um, eradicated rats. Okay, so here's the seabird data. So again, this is a heat map. And you can see along the bottom, we've got the scattered islands and the Chagos archipelago. Uh, and then we've got um, whether the islands uh, are eradicated, the rats have been eradicated, whether rats are present um, or whether they've always been absent. And it's a bit hard to take all this in, in, in a, you know, in, in a minute or so that I'm going to show this slide, but the take home here is that um, 
so the lighter colors, the yellows and greens, are, there's more birds. And the take home is that there's intermediate bird uh, seabird biomass on the rat eradicated islands. So basically the populations of seabirds are increasing and developing on these islands. And the time since rat eradication varies uh, from about four years through to about 12 years of, the, of these islands. So over these sort of decadal timescales, we're seeing this, uh, this buildup of, of, of seabird populations again onto the islands. So then we um, uh, did some work with isotopes again um, on the islands. We collected the soil and, and uh, leaves from coastal shrubs. And on the, in the reef environment, we collected uh, macroalgae, turf algae, and fish muscle tissue again. So this is the estimated difference in delta 15N in the, in, in, in the nitrogen, um, where there's, uh, above that line, there's more nutrients where there's no rats, and below there's more nutrients where there's rats. So this is the estimated difference. So this first, uh, these first um, uh, 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 spread of data are the, the, the difference between islands where rats have always been absent and rats have been, uh, and rats are present. And you can see there, there, there's, a, there's a big difference. So, so this is sort of confirming or validating the, um, uh, the first study I showed today, um, where there's a big effect of, um, of uh, seabird presence on soil and new growth leaves for the, in terms of the delta-15N in those tissues. And as you go out to the reef, uh, there's a strong signal in macroalgae and there's, a, there's still a signal, but it, it, it attenuates, it becomes smaller when you get to turf algae and fish. If we look at the difference between islands where rats have been eradicated um, and, and where rats are present, um, we see an intermediate difference, as you might expect again, because the seabird populations are, are recovering and we're starting to see that, that subsidy, we're starting to see the difference in, in, uh, in, in nitrogen signals in the tissues on, on land, in the soil and the leaves and, and out into the marine environment. So these subsidies are developing, uh, which is, is, is really quite promising, I think. We then started looking a little bit um, at the spatial extent of these subsidies, so, so how, how far the subsidies might be reaching out onto the reefs uh, by collecting samples at different distances from shore. So here's just a couple of plots um, for macroalgae and, and for damselfish. Um, the blue line is, is for the islands where rats have been eradicated, and the red line is where they're present. So we don't have any data in, uh, um, uh, for this, for where there's never been rats. Um, and you can see where, the, where, where these lines are intersecting. So these nutrient subsidies are extending you know, up to 500, 700 meters uh, from shore, which for fringing reefs is, is significant. So, so, so they are extending out, on, out across, across the reefs, at least the scale that these, these reefs uh, are around the islands we've been looking at. Um, and, and this fits with some quite nice work from New Caledonia looking at a distance that nutrient subsidies from seabirds are, are being utilised and picked up in coral tissue. So this is, it's really scrapped on the surface at this stage and we're, we're in the process of uh, putting in a, a grant application actually to extend this work now to include um, islands in, in, um, in the Seychelles and also in French Polynesia, so Tetiaroa, which has um, islands with black rats, islands with Polynesian rats, islands with no rats, and they're about to eradicate all of the rats on, on the whole um, atoll next year. So we're trying to extend this work and start building this picture up and, and build an idea of the nutrient scape. So the, the sort of distances of these nutrients are propagating um, spatially around the reefs around islands, and also how they're propagating up through the food web. So really get an idea of, 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 of the extent of the uh, nutrient influence into the reef system. Okay, and with that, um, I'd like to thank you all for listening um, and thank the funders of this work.